On this episode of AV Week, where the direct view LED market is in the AV industry, how holograms can enhance the experience, and getting trained in the audiovisual industry. All that and more, next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 339, recorded Friday, February 23rd, 2018. Training AV. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by FSR and by Peerless AV, the official outdoor display provider of Daytona International Speedway. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host. With us to talk about the news that we have gathered for this week. First and foremost, her name is Corey Schaefer. She works for QSC, and her husband has the best name in the world. How are you, madam? I'm fabulous today. Thank you. Her husband's name is Tim. That means you get that <laughs> joke there. They call him Tim. They call him Tim. Uh, not quite like that, though. Uh, you know, Tim Shaver is actually pretty cool. Um, also with us is Gina Sansevero, and she is from FSR. How are you, madam? I'm doing very well, Tim. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Uh, last but not least, Mike Abernathy. Uh, he is from NSCA, and actually uh, Gina and I will see Mike uh, later this week as we're recording this on Friday, but uh, we will see him. Uh, we'll release this on Monday. We'll see him at the BLC. How are you, sir? I'm well. Thanks, Tim. Great to be here. Absolutely. All right, so let's kick this off. Uh, first up and foremost comes to us from our friends over at AV Network. NEC has acquired German direct view LED manufacturer. And, and uh, what I want to do is, is they, they uh, acquired a company called Squadrat. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name, but it's an S and some parentheses and Q-U-A-D-R-A-T is the name of, of the company, the way it's spelled at least. And, and they, they, uh, they acquired this company. They're a provider of LED solutions. As the company, quote unquote, expands its display technology portfolio to include complete LED systems for indoor fine pitch and outdoor solutions designed and engineered in Germany. Mike, I want to start with you on this as you talk with integrators you know, across North America. Where do you see the, the market here as far as market saturation and where you see maybe this move by NEC to get into the direct view LED uh, market? Yeah, you know, I have this, these conversations a lot with our members and, uh, and so forth. So mergers and acquisitions happen all the time here or happening more often, it seems like here over the last year. But with the direct uh, view LED side, I, I look at where NEC is going. And the opportunity that I saw in there was the whole as a service side of things mm. and how maybe this, this uh, um, you know, acquisition will help them with the whole uh, visualization as a service and moving towards that uh, more on the AV side than just the traditional IT and managed services side of things. So visualization as a service, I like that. Um, uh, Corey, I want to bring you on this. When, when you pick up a company um, and you try to you know m merge them together, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. Um, Mike mentioned the whole mergers and acquisitions and, and we, I was at PSNI's Super Summit this week. And um, I, I, di I did a panel uh, with some, some AV uh, integrators as well as manufacturers. Um, three or four of the people on the panel were involved in a merger and acquisition in the last 12 months. Wow. So that, that came up, right? Yeah. And, you know, some of them have gone really well. Uh, and some of them have been difficult marriages, right? Uh, yeah. to, to use an analogy. Um, how do you do that, right? How do you successfully bring in two different cultures and two different groups of folks and successfully run a business, run a manufacturing firm or run a, you know, an integration firm, even at that, um, when you have two separate cultures, one, unless it's a pure merger, one is going to be the dominant because they were the purchaser, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's our money, <laughs> it's our yeah. decision, but you still have to have everybody kind of working together. Yeah, I think the, um, you hit on it. It's about really merging the cultures together and, um, in my opinion, it, you do, it, it's never easy. I don't think any acquisition and blending things together is ever easy because number one, it's change. We all really, re, you know, we're, we resist change. 
we're hesitant to change, et cetera. And I think for companies, companies that do it well, uh, they, they, they recognize that it's not easy and they put in a lot of work uh, into the communication side of it because with change comes uncertainty. So you just have to really, really over communicate. And uh, if you're the dominant one, help the, uh, the other culture understand how valued they are and why the acquisition occurred and how important they are to the overall success. It takes just a tremendous amount of communication. We at QSC acquired a company, I think it's now been a couple of years ago. So geographically in a different location, just, uh, you know, QSC was much larger. And we just immediately involved them in all hands meetings. We uh, did not really change um, where they physically were. Everyone worried about, you know, losing their job and, um, you know, um, how they would really contribute to this much larger organization. And uh, it, the company uh, just over communicated and spent a lot of time visiting and having them come to QSC and having QSC come to where they were located, et cetera, at uh, QSC people at all levels. And I think, you know, we've seen acquisition happen on the integrator side. You know, Mike, you, you see it all the time. And some of those um, don't go as well because even though they may have a new logo uh, uh, on their business card, uh, they're still really behaving like they always have. And, uh, and it, it's just, it's, it's difficult. And I think the best way to do it is just over communicate and make sure everybody knows how valued they are. Uh, I'm, I'm going to relay a story again from this panel from, from PSNI. And it was an integrator yeah. who had purchased another integrator and this is up in Canada. So you, you'll understand what they did, why they did what they did. Um, they met at a ski resort, a ski lodge, and they brought everybody together. Right. And, you know, they had meetings and they went skiing and this, that, and the other. And, and the head of the group uh, said this to me afterwards. He goes, you know, he goes, yes, it was good to, to, get, to kind of get, you know, processed together. And you, you, you have got your flip charts, your collaboration spaces and your whiteboards and you're doing all this stuff. He goes, that was great. He goes, do you know what, ha- what really kind of brought everybody together? He goes, it was the evening time around the yeah. bar and around the fire. And just getting to learn and, and know the people as people. Yeah. Uh, was, that went a long way in, in bringing these two organizations together. You know, we all know this. When you, you, know, you visit a customer, you have meetings, et cetera. But when you have a, gal- a golf outing or you take them out uh, later, it just elevates the whole relationship to a whole new level. It's, you know, people are people. So it's, it's, it's about really getting to know people on that human level. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right, Gina, how do we, how do we merge these two? How do we merge two companies in general together? Well, I agree with what Corey said. What actually really um, struck me in this article was that it almost seemed like NEC was very smart about this acquisition. They started to get to know um, Squadron first. It was like a lease with an option to buy. Um, it looks like they had the past three years, they had somehow coordinated their either a, a co-op marketing um, opportunity or something like that, where NEC really got a feel for the company before they they decided what they were going to do. And I think that that's really important too, um, you know, kind of bringing people in from all sides and having that time to really get to know each other before you make that final decision or sign the final paperwork and make it, make it public can be a really insightful time for both your employees and your executives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our, our next uh, story comes to us from our buddies over at Commercial Integrator. Uh, Epson has announced that BASE Hologram, B-A-S-E, a new live entertainment company launched from BASE Entertainment, has chosen the Pro L series laser projectors to drive its new holographic shows of Roy Orbison and opera singer Maria Callas. Corey, I'm gonna start with you on this. Uh, about nine, actually less than a month ago, uh, here in the States, the Super Bowl, the biggest NFL game of the year, there was actually a rumor. Uh, Justin Timberlake did the, the halftime show. There was a rumor that he was going to have a hologram of Prince. Huge fan of Prince. I have no problem with, with him incorporating Prince's music. Uh, the Super Bowl was held in Minneapolis, which was Prince's hometown. Mm-hmm. And apparently some of Prince's, you know, his, 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 uh, his estate and some folks who used to work with Prince apparently got a hold of JT and said, you probably don't want to do that. And so ended up being this, this ginormous screen behind Justin Timberlake with a, a you know, a projection of, of Prince on it instead of a hologram. 
my, my question to all three of you and Corey, we'll start on this. This is not the first time we've, we've gone down the holographic road. A couple of years ago, somebody did one of Tupac on stage. And it, it, I want to ask the question, I want to be respectful of Epson, but my question is a little pointed. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Yeah, you know, true. I mean, when I first read this story, I just thought, how cool, actually, because um, it's, you know, a whole new level of augmented reality, and it just really changes the experience. But, but you're right, I think we have to look at um, every element. And um, no, I don't think just because we can, we should. But um, for me, I'm, I'm so excited about all of the all the augmented reality that's coming. And for me personally, selfishly, you know, being able to have that type of an experience because it just, it, it just changes it, 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 Vixa and everybody's talking about the enhanced experience and boy, does this do that. So, um, let me ask uh, you a question. Yeah. Another way, cause, cause Prince was one of those, was one of those folks that I wanted to see before either he died or I died. Right. Yeah, um, ditto. And I was, I was lucky enough to do that once. Right. Um, still in my top five best ever live performances I've ever seen was Prince here in, here in St. Louis. Wow. Does that lessen that experience? The fact that my kids who were born or who were born after I had the, the live experience with Prince yeah. and to be frank, they were a little young <laughs> to go to yeah. a Prince concert, um, you know, be, before he passed away, they could go see a Prince concert now. Yep. Yeah. They, they could go see that. But does that lessen my experience? I mean, you know, anybody who was born, um, you know, after, you know, the 1970s could never have gone to see the Beatles together. But now with this technology, you know, we all four could go to a Beatles concert. Does that lessen those experiences? No, I think it enhances the experience for sure. Okay. Because, you know, it's, it's, you know, when we hear music, we, we tend to emotionally bring back, you know, it, in our minds, we're thinking about an experience about a song, you know, et cetera. And this just really takes that to a whole nother level. And you and your kids get to sh have somewhat shared experience and therefore even take it further. So I, mm. I personally think it um, doesn't take anything away. I think it enhances it. All right. Gina, same question to you, just because we should do, we can do this. Does it mean that we should? Well, I was reading this from more of the education world, right? So okay. for me, this is so enveloping that it becomes memorable. And when you remember something, um, you tend to start thinking about it comprehensively. How does it inf Im impact other parts of my life? How does, it, um, how does it actually work? And you start thinking a little bit deeper about things when you're kind of thrown into it like that. So, so for example, my son loves, 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 loves to play guitar. And he will never be able to go see Jimi Hendrix play guitar. Yep. But if Jimi Hendrix was a hologram and he was able to somehow interact with that hologram, it brings his learning, his understanding to a different level. Um, if, if that's the way he wants to play guitar, why not be able to recreate that from the master? And I, and I really think that from an educational standpoint, it'll just, it's one of those things, it's one of those pieces that if you learn how to use it within a training room or a, some sort of a learning space, um, it's going to really bring education to a different level. Yeah, you know, I thought the same thing about the educational side of it as well. And, and uh, for me, I was thinking about the Holocaust Museum in DC mm -hmm. and just what an amazing experience that museum really was for me. But then I thought, imagine if they could bring, you know, bring a hologram into uh, into a museum like that, a museum that is really designed to help us remember. Uh, I mean, again, I we all learn differently, and I just think that'd be very impactful. What happens if you're interacting with the founding fathers and watching them sign the Declaration of Independence? And then you get to ask them questions, and they actually respond to you in their own yeah. likeness, in their own mannerisms. In the, I mean, how? Cool. Amazing is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and just really think how many influential. kids you'll just get right into the history and learning more about civics and, and things like that. Well, I mean, we had textbooks, kind of right? Textbooks with flat pictures, and and every once in a while we got to see movies like 
glory or something like that that really kind of were poignant but didn't really bring it home for us in a personal way. This is so impactful. I'm just I'm, I'm just waiting for, you know, because because Gina and I are, you know, Gina's a little bit younger than I, but her and I both had, you know, the 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 film projectors that you had to feed and you know. I did as well. Yeah. Those were fun. Um, I had no projectors. I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyhow. <laughs> Mike, um when it comes to these installations then, what are we looking at? As you know, obviously Epson is, is featured in this story. But from an integrator standpoint, I mean, what, I mean, what skill set? And we're going to talk about training here in a second. But what skill set do you need to do this? Yeah, good, good question. And and, and that's one thing I was thinking about. What is the opportunity for the integrator uh, in, in these type of uh, um, applications and so forth? So I was, you, you brought up the whole museum side of things, and that's where I see that. Um, I I think you know when we look at the technology and everything's changing. And you know, where a lot, of, especially AV integrators, they're learning new ways to do things all the time. The way you know, the way application moving towards managed services, and and, and those type of things. So it, this may lead into our, our later conversation. Is is uh, um, you know what type of training will help in these type of applications? And uh, I think the interesting thing is 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 base hologram and base entertainment. Uh, they're a production company, right? Yeah. They're all, you know, they're yeah. all about producing shows and things like that. You look at their partners. Yeah, Epson is uh, is our partner on the technology side, but the rest of their partners are all um, agencies and booking agencies and things like that. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, we've talked about mentioned a couple of times. We're going to go to our last story here from our buddies over AV Magazine. Uh, they're doing a survey, and I I, the, I thought the question on the survey was actually appropriate. So we're going to actually just steal it and ask the question. You're more than welcome. We'll have a link on the site to go take their survey. But it's about training in the AV industry. Quote, unquote, we want to get a picture of where our industry needs suitable, uh, suitably qualified AV staff, which skills and qualifications are most in demand within the AV industry, and why and how training and standards bodies can underpin this. So Gina, we're going to start with you. Where are we at with training in the AV industry, whether it's from an organization uh, like Avixa or or Cedia um, or NSCA or uh, manufacturing? Um, Well, I think that there's plenty of training out there um, to be had. I think that from a an integrator standpoint um, and from an end user standpoint, you definitely have the opportunity to have manufacturer training. You can have um, industry training from Avixa and NSCA and organizations such as that. Um, but it's really up to the employer to set the standard to which they want their employees trained. And I think that that's still a little bit up in the air. Our, uh, for example, our CTS. Um, certifications required for engineers um, is product uh, project management certifications required for your project managers so i think that still now as we're trying to find our way towards more of a professional service provider rather than a, a group of roadies and musicians who found their way into this industry. I think that certifications are going to become more important. I think training is going to become um, a real keystone in, in that part of it. Now, that being said, there's also ways of kind of making sure that the new people that you're hiring are trained coming into this so that you're not recreating um, this culture of professional services, that they, they have this culture as they're coming in, and that's through um, industry groups like Ignite. And I think Ignite really allows you to see what an, a knowledgeable, educated um, young person coming into this industry is really capable of bringing to this industry from a professional standpoint, that they're not necessarily coming in blank, um, not really understanding it from, from a different industry, but they're actually coming in with knowledge um, about this industry and how to carry themselves both in front of clients and in front of their, their co-workers. So, well, and Gina, also- Gina, oh, sorry. Will you expand on Ignite a bit? Because people listening may not understand. 
Oh, absolutely. So Ignite is um, brought to you by the NSCA Education Foundation. And what the Ignite ambassadors do is that they're, they're usually AV systems integrators, but also manufacturers who go to schools, whether it's colleges and universities or K-12 institutions around the country and hopefully around the world one day. Um, and they're able to talk to these young people about training about what AV does. Um, I was able to do that at my son's high school and we spoke a lot about, to Tim's point, um, what the Super Bowl kind of halftime show is is like. We talked about different big bells and whistles installations and real experiences from, um, you know, large events and then to smaller installations but really impactful in installations like museums. Um, so what happens is you kind of get their juices flowing and you get the fire lit and they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. This is neat. How do I learn more? And, and you get to kind of mentor them through that and show them the path to AV. And I feel like that's so much better than having either fallen into it and trying to, to learn about it um, yeah. or having followed a route that was from a a different industry into it. So does that help? Yeah, and if I can add a couple things, I, I, I think the best way to uh, um, describe Ignite, it's a grassroots effort to share the good news and share what our industry does. And you get out into your community as an integrator, as a manufacturer, you build those relationships with the, you know, with the technical schools or the community colleges, with the high school, build out those relationships with the instruct instructors and other key stakeholders there and say, hey, this is what we do. This is how we help and how we, you know, help companies and schools and things like that to bring solutions. So, And the cool thing about it is that all the Ignite ambassadors that I have met are so passionate about this industry that it's fun to watch them. Yeah. You know, so it's engaging just to, to, to be able to be in that room with people who love what they do. It, it is, and I've noticed that as well. We're up to 90 ambassadors. Hopefully that'll keep growing. Maybe we'll add some next week at uh, BLC, Business and Leadership Conference there uh, that NSCA is hosting. And with that, uh, Chuck Wilson, Executive Director of NSCA, wanted me to share there's going to be a, a big announcement about Ignite uh, next week. So uh, Gina, you'll be sitting in on that uh, uh, presentation. So something you can learn, and Tim, you can report on it. All right. Oh man, I hate surprises. I know. You can just tell us now and we won't tell anybody. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Gina, I want, I want to drill down on something with, with you and, and actually, Corey, I'll bring you in on this as well. Talk us for a second about the difference between end-user education and integrator education. Um, because Gina and I are going to be together with, at a technology manager summit uh, on March 8th in Raleigh, North Carolina, that is for technology managers, right? Yeah. It is. And, and it, I'm a former tech manager, so I, I feel a little bit of, of liberty to say this, but, but tech managers are not necessarily end users. They are the go-between between the end end, the end, end user, um, to steal a, a phrase from, from Brad, uh, from Navigate. Well, you know, he's, he's just done what's done and what's done done. The end end user, um, the people who are actually physically using the facilities on a daily basis. Those are professors. Those are the CEOs and the, the, the workers that, that use the conference rooms and the, and the classrooms. But these are the folks who design a lot of times. They, they maintain the systems. Sometimes they program the systems. Education for those folks as well as, as, as and the difference between that and educating the integrators. I'll jump in because this is very top of mind for me personally. At, at, at my company, we actually do – uh, what we call QSIS training. We have level one and level two. Level one's online, level two's uh, two days in the classroom. And much of this is was really designed for the integrator. And so it really ha helps them create the, you know, the design file, et cetera, on how it's going to be installed, the number of open microphones at any given time, how do I EQ, you know what I mean? Kind of all of those that are part of a design. And we have many end users that want to take that class. But the truth is, is what's being taught isn't really relevant to them. And I mean, I mean the people like the tech managers, you know, not the end end user. So um, what they need is different. They need to know how to troubleshoot. So because they're typically, you know, they've got level one and level two support from when their end end user reaches out to them and has an issue with the technology, they need to be able to identify 
where the issue is and potentially how to resolve it. And I think that we manufacturers have focused so much just on, you know, the integrator side of it um, that uh, they're kind of out there taking these manufacturers trainings and, and so much of it's just not relevant. So we're taking a step back and we, we are creating a curriculum that's more of a, you know, troubleshooting and how to, how to look at, at, uh, in our case, a QSIS designer file and be able to identify where the issues are so that also if they're calling us, they can, they, they know, they can, um, they know what they're talking about and can help guide us in, in how to support them. But, but their need is just very different because there's, there's more in a uh, troubleshooting, not how to create a design. But an educated caller, right? An educated yeah. consumer, not yeah. just a professor calling you guys up and saying, Hey, my system doesn't work. Oh yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So from my standpoint in the education world, we're finding a lot of the um, larger universities have AV service departments that are centralized departments within the entire university. And they are essentially in-house on staff integrators. They are designers, they are installers, they are maintainers. Um, and so a lot of the classes that um, an integrator would take are relevant in that world. Um, but like Corey said, then smaller universities or even the colleges, the schools within those universities um, have people who, who do not have design capabilities or that is just not part of their responsibility. So having that idea of troubleshooting is imperative to them. Um, and then from, from that standpoint, from, from the AV services, a centralized um, part of the university, they're always looking for training in every aspect of AV, not just in what the integrator feels would be relevant to them. So when manufacturers reach out directly and they say, okay, we will train you on, you know, the, the specifications of certain product lines or whatever it is, um, it allows them to get a, a bigger idea of what's out there for them and allows them to kind of create their own standards that'll work for them on campus. So rather than going to an integrator and saying, okay, we have this type of room, this type of the room, this type of room, this type of room, help me create a standard for design. They go to the integrator and they say, okay, this is my standard for design. I need help implementing it. And then they'll be able to do that. So they're more educated when they're, they're trained from a manufacturer's standpoint. Yeah. They're able to create those design specifications. They're able to create those tiered specifications. Um, we're starting to see that as well. And yeah. we're starting to see just more out, uh, end users reach out to us manufacturers than ever before wanting training because once a system is in and done and there may need to be some tweaks made to it. And it's just difficult to, you know, either try to get an integrator out for what might be an hour's worth of time, or maybe geographically it's just a challenge to get to. Or it can and they be want expensive, it. you know, yeah. really can. Sure. Because a lot of, you know, some integrators have minimums, you know, and so if you're paying $100 to $150 an hour for a truck roll and you have a minimum of four hours and all you need is, is one small tweak, it may not be worth it, but it would make their lives a lot, awful lot easier. Right. So. Yeah. And that's not to say that integrators aren't, a valuable part of this no, whole no. puzzle. Yeah. I mean, they absolutely are. It's just having an educated tech manager is is preferred. And yeah, honestly, I, mean, I, I, I was just going to give the analogy. Yeah. I think it's a lot like when we go to the doctor, if we only listen to what the doctor has to say, I mean, you know, we're being told, take control of your own health, you know? And I doctors really do like it when you're asking questions and, and wanting them to explain and, and educate you. And I think the same thing in technology. No, and actually, I think an, an educated uh, cons an educated tech manager actually makes the integrator's job easier. So. Absolutely. All right, Tim. Uh, uh, Tim, <laughs> Mike, I don't think you'll have the last word. My name is Tim. It, it's been a long week. Uh, <laughs> where are we at with education in the AV industry? Yeah, uh, I think you know you look at AV education. Uh, VIX is doing a great job with uh, CTS. Obviously, CD is doing a great job. I kind of look at it coming from uh, NSCA's point of view, and of course, it's more of a integrator um, from the integrator point of view, and that's focusing more on okay, 
how do we, and that's what BLC, uh, the uh, event uh, you were at this week, uh, as well as focusing on the business side of things. How can we help integrators with key business issues uh, and, and so forth? And, uh, and then that can pass right down along with to, to the end user. And uh, one thing in this whole conversation that uh, an integrator up in the Northeast shared with me, he was, uh, it was all about, uh, he took some leadership training and leadership workshop. And what he started doing, he saw the value in it. And he started training his customers in that, bringing his customers in, maybe at a nominal fee or something like that. And just the stickiness and things like that. So doing those type of things and training as well. So I'm kind of looking at it more from a business point of view and the tools and so forth. Uh, and uh, maybe finding ways for integrators. We talked about rolling a truck just for a, a, a little tweak or something like that. Um, you know, that's where the whole managed service, turning AV into a service. And instead of selling it as a project, this is a discussion we're having with a lot of our members. Corey, I think you're well aware of this as well. And, and, yeah. and Gina, I'm seeing this with some of your stuff as well, is that, you know, instead of selling the project, I'll just throw a number out of $100,000, right? Okay. And 25 up front and, you know, 25 in the, uh, in the middle and then at, at commissioning, you know, pay the rest is okay. 36 months, 60 months, uh, as an integrator, you're offering this as a service. And then at the end of those, the, the term, you know, do you want to upgrade your solution, right? Cause technology changes, your applications change and so forth and moving towards that type of a model for integrators. And, uh, I think you'll, we'll be seeing that. And, and uh, we're trying here at NSCA is, trying to help our members and, and equip our members with those tools to do so. Yeah, absolutely. I think All that's right. perfect, Mike. I mean, one of the things that creates a really stable organization is when the executives and the directors are able to work on their business rather than in their business. So you get yeah. bogged down with that day to day, right? And, and yep. being able to work on strategy and being able to kind of lead and allow your employees to really, you know, take, take the, the ropes and, yeah. and kind of move it forward. And that way you can kind of refocus and start the strategy all over again. So, Absolutely. yeah. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us. Thank you all three so much. Uh, Miss Corey Schaefer from QSC. How do people find you uh, or QSC? Uh, QSC.com. You can also find uh, Corey C-O-R-Y Schaefer uh, on uh, every social media platform. Look for me there. All right. Very good. Uh, also, Ms. San Severo, I'll get to hang out with you two weeks in a row. Uh, but if you're not me, how do people find you? <laughs> um, I am at Gina Sands or at FSR underscore EDU on Twitter, um, FSRinc.com. And also, if anybody is in the Raleigh-Durham area in two weeks on March 8th, you can go to um, Technology Managers Summit 2018.eventbrite.com for details on that event as well. And we'll, if you didn't write that down fast enough, we'll put a link on, on, on this episode's page as well. So. Sweet. Uh, all right, Mr. Abernathy, not only do we get to hang out with you also, how do people find you and or NSCA? Yeah, so NSCA, NSCA.org and uh, just M. Abernathy um, as well at NSCA.org. So uh if I can say a, a quick thank you to yeah. you for next week for your support of BLC, as well as to Gina and FSR and the whole team there. And, and Corey, Frank will be there as well. Uh, QSC. Thank you everyone for your, uh, for your support of BLC. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a really good event. And we were talking about right. this earlier before we even start recording events like this. And, and I mentioned that was a super summit last week and, and AVEC and some other ones that don't talk about tech, that don't talk about the, the gears and gizmos and gadgets of AV, but talk about the business and how to make the business better and how to make your relationships with each other better, I think are incredibly valuable. Um, and I, I value my time at them because it helps me honestly um, serve, you know, you guys better. It helps me serve our, our, our audience better. And I think it helps the industry better. And, and to Gina's point, it helps those integrators work, you know, 
on their business rather than in their business. So looking forward to it. So, uh, all right. Uh, don't follow me on the Twitters at this point. I'm crossing my fingers and hoping the blues make the playoffs. Uh, but go by the uh, website if you would please avnation.tv avnation.tv you will find this program and a host of others uh, we have another weekly show that looks at the residential side of a av and the news that happens on a weekly basis that's called resi week hosted by my buddy matt uh matt d scott um also have a number of monthly shows we've got one that looks at the business of av called the av profession marketing and social media control and programming and education and a whole bunch of others also while you're there if you check out our underwriters section these are the folks who help us financially and help us do things like go to blc and go to digital signage expo and ISE a couple weeks ago and infocom and uh, fsr is one of those and we thank them for their support as well as our other other underwriters so check all that out and more at avnation.tv avnation.tv thanks so much so much for listening thank you so much for watching that is all the time we have for av week Thank you.